please welcome with a warm applause, <laughs> Professor Patrick Utomi. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, one of the dangers of wearing a parachute is, <laughs> is the possibility that you can trip. So I had to be very, very careful. But I am so grateful uh, to Pastor Boju for this great idea. Uh, nothing beats a great idea. And we're here and we live with it. Very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have chosen to speak to a very simple subject, but it's a subject that is really at the soul of the essence of my being because in many ways, the subject remains the central part of my struggle to think over the last 50 something years. And, and why do I say so? I say so because it's always been for me a struggle for meaning. Why am I here? And anybody who does not ask that question misses the very essence of their being. Why are you here? If you think you were here just as an accident, well, that's what you think and you have a right to thinking whatever you choose to think. But I think that anybody who really gives some thought to why am I here must proceed to finding some central sense for being. And in this pursuit of a sense for being, I have tried to understand why man continually and continuously seeks progress. Why does man seek progress? Uh, as a young undergraduate at the University of Nigeria, just shortly after the Civil War, we had these general studies programs, uh, the so-called GS programs. And, and one of the things that um, really caught my uh, attention that early was the idea of a hierarchy of needs, Abraham Maslow and a hierarchy of human needs. The fact that man just seems unable to get satisfaction. You satisfy a certain need state, and you desire more, 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 and more. More for what? But man does often exhibit that desire to get more. And the challenge of understanding began to drive me on. By the way, when I was looking at those photographs of Nigeria Airways in the early West Africa, uh, uh, Airways Corporations days reminded me very much of what I wanted to be. When I was in high school at Loyola College in Ibado, I wanted to be an airline pilot. And when I got out of school, um, my father and I had to do a deal. I wanted to be a pilot. He thought I had a different kind of... A, and so he said, look, let's resolve this thing. Um, the, the friends that you can rely on in life are the ones you make in in university, your roommates and those kinds of people. You can trust them no matter what happens to you in life. So why don't you go to university? Spend a year or two, learn a few things, make some friends, and then you can come out and go to flying school. Well, as I like to say, when I got to university, I ran into something called the library. And instead of going to flying school, I went to graduate school. <laughs> but during that period, as I tr struggled to find meaning. One of the things that came clear to me is the essence of man in creation. And I often refer to myself as a Genesis 2.15 person. The fact of taking dominion over this earth really translates to man being created to be a partner with God, a co-creator with God, moving creation towards his perfection. And so that fundamental essence of being as a co-creator, as a partner, has led me to asking constantly the question, what shapes human progress? What really does make us make progress? And I take as an interesting example of the challenge of how human progress has been differently lived and made, a point that uh, 
gentleman of great note called Peter Drucker makes about the 20th century. He makes the point that at the beginning of the 20th century, the difference in the quality of life of the average African and the average European was basically marginal, more or less the same. The nobility had a lot more, surely, in Europe. But the average people, quality of life was basically the same. But as the 20th century came to a close, the difference in the quality of life of the average African and the average European was like night and day. And so the question that has obsessed me is what happened during the 20th century. Peter Drucker says that what happens was a dramatic increase in productivity in Europe, fueled by education and technology, and obviously the fact that Africa did not keep pace. Um, in that century, by the way, a great big debate started amongst economists about why Africa was growing so slowly. And that debate is represented uh, generally by two economists, one from Oxford, the other at Harvard at the time. My good fortune of my life is I had the opportunity to work with both gentlemen. At one end uh, of the spectrum uh, was uh, Paul Collier at Oxford and Jeffrey Sachs. And a framework that I will introduce here came from my going as part of Jeff Sachs' team to make a presentation at the World Economic Forum in the year 2000. But this period, essentially, of trying to establish why Africa was not growing as Europe was growing, it led to perspectives, and there are always many perspectives about everything. One perspective said that Africa was growing very slowly because Africa was destined to be poor. Well, it was called the destiny argument or the geography uh, interpretation. Africa was in the tropics, and so that little small insect called the mosquito was inflicting malaria on the people of Africa, and so people of Africa were too weak to produce, and so productivity was low. And so Africa was poor because of that geography point. That was the point that I think Jeff Sachs, in many ways, is unfairly pushed into a corner on that, but that he advanced. And that was why he argued that one of the things the world should do for Africa was get together and help it defeat malaria. It was not by accident, actually. It was a pure proposal that President Obasanjo's first major program was called Roll Back Malaria. It was as a result of that argument. Uh, Paul Collier, on the other hand, argues this is complete nonsense. Africa is poor because African leaders make the wrong policy choices. It was not hard to tell that I was more on the Collier side of that conversation than the Jeff Sachs side of the conversation. Anyway, I got a chance, like I said, to work with uh, Jeff Sachs on the Africa Competitiveness Report. And when this report was being presented in the year 2000 at the World Economic Forum uh, Southern Africa Summit in Durban, um, a very humorous president of Mozambique uh, asked a question. He says, look, you experts have come again. Every time you tell us that, uh, you know, if we want to attract investments and grow our economy, we must do X, Y, Z. And we faithfully obey. But what you say will happen does not happen. Say, first of all, you say we should tighten our belts. And we began to tighten our belts. The belts became so tight that you could not see anybody. All you saw was belts. <laughs> but the investments did not come. And we went back to the World Bank. And we said, look, our belts are so tight, we don't have body anymore. And they said, you see, what you need to do is be patient. And so we became so patient that our middle names became patients. <laughs> but investments did not come. And we said, oh my goodness, World Bank, what are we going to do? And they said, you see, people want to see track records. So we went back home, we're laying down tracks, and we're making records. <laughs> but investments did not come. Um, it occurred to me as that humorous exercise was taking place that in many ways, part of the problem of the multilaterals in advising us in Africa is an inclination towards unicausal analysis. The cause of your problem is this one thing or that thing. Clearly, a set of variables which were interdependent, we are interacting to produce the African condition. 
And I went back to my hotel room and began to sketch something. That thing I sketch works out to what I call the growth driver's framework and the central organizing theme of my book, Why Nations Are Poor. The growth driver's framework essentially captures a, a number of variables that I suspect more than infrastructure and some of those uh, things we often talk about are responsible for why growth is not taking place as it should take place.